God makes a point, especially with what I'm getting ready to preach on this morning. We're starting a new series, which uh, I have entitled Paths to Walk In. You know, the presence of God was so powerful this morning that we could actually kind of stop church right now and say, I've had church. I love that. And uh, I, I think God's making a point with where I'm getting ready to head with what we're going to teach. Wednesday night we begin to deal with several things, and there is a convergence of prophetic signals that are probably coming together like I've never seen before. And we're putting pieces of the puzzle together, and some of it can be kind of conflicting, because I'm a guy who would like to know when stuff's going to happen, you know, that, uh, that if disaster is going to happen, I'd like to know the day that it was going to happen so that I could be prepared. And uh, I don't think necessarily God is showing us the day or the hour, but we can definitely see the seasons coming. And we were dealing Wednesday night about how um, one very prominent Messianic rabbi kind of believes that we're in the tribulation period. And I, I can kind of see some of the things behind what he's saying. But at the same time, it's kind of like, yeah, but not yet. And, you know, it's, you ever feel like that? I mean, you can kind of see things coming together. And, you, and, and we're, we're, we're seeing different things like with the harbingers, the next harbinger, if the, pat, if the pattern uh, continues with Rabbi Khan, it's, I think the next one's due in uh, 2015. And uh, Chad brought up some neat things. And one of the things, I, I made a, a comment here a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember if it was on, on Sabbath or it was a Wednesday night. After you learn Torah, the prophets are a whole new book. They're, they're brand new because you, you, you didn't have the paradigm that they were writing from to be able to understand them. And so we get all these crazy interpretations and different things. And, and uh, Chad made the comment. He says, well, you know, I, I just know that I, I've got a marker when we get to the middle that there will be an altar and they'll be doing sacrifices, and the Word of God says that the, the Antichrist will stop it in the midst of the week or the halfway through the tribulation period. And so he's kind of watching for that altar to go up and see who stops it. Then he's like, ah, oh, I know who you are now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he made an interesting comment because, you know, a lot of the um, commentators, well, they, they kind of speculate, well, maybe they, they were doing sacrifices for three and a half years, and he stops it in the middle. Uh, but he made a, a great point that really he could have stopped it on the eighth day because it takes seven days for them doing what they do according to Torah to consecrate the altar and to consecrate uh, the, the temple mount, and they have to. He can't desecrate unless it's been, there's been a consecrate shun, okay? And so don't know exactly when it's, it's going to happen. Uh, we do know that uh, many of the rabbis, especially the Orthodox, are prepared if there ever comes the Gog Magog War or a major conflict over there. The, while everybody's fighting, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take over the Temple Mount and set up the altar. And so, literally, in this day and this hour, all eyes are pointed toward Jerusalem. And so, you know, I have a lot of questions. You know, what, where are we on God's prophetic calendar? How much time do we have left? When will the tribulation period start? And all these different things because I want to make sure that I got my food supplies all set up and, and have a backup generator and all the things you need to do. And, you know, sometimes that's just good to have because you don't really know when. I remember here a few years back, I was in uh, Canada in January preaching. Never going to do that again. That's a bad place to go in January. Try it in June. Uh, but we had a major ice storm that I came back, and we were out of power for about a week or so. How many know that uh, food stock and water stock and, and uh, having secondary power systems, just something that makes common sense? And you realize just how little the grocery stores in the area have to meet the population, that within a day or two of that ice storm, there was no water. And one of the stores, when they got water in, the price doubled or tripled. I can't remember. It was like... No, <laughs> but you saw that because there was a shortage and it's, it's you know, it, and so it, it's good to be prepared. And, and I, was, I was dealing with some of these things and God says, you're, you're still kind of missing the point. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, can I, can I still have my stockpile of food? That's kind of good too, you know, because you just never know. And he said, yeah, he said, he said, you can have that and still not be ready. Do you know that you can have 15 years worth of, of propane to, to uh, do a generator, you can have 15 years worth of food, 15 years worth of water, and still not be ready. I'm thinking, hmm, okay. And I, I got an email to, uh, this week from a prophetic voice in America that I, I respect, and, and all I read 
was the title of the article he wrote. And God said, stop there. Let me show you some things. And then after you preach it, go back and see if what you agree with. And the title of his article was The Presence Driven Life. And I mean, it, it just shot up like big red flares to me. Because in, in the last uh, few years, probably about the last eight or nine years, that there has been a popular movement on the purpose-driven life. And uh, I've been at this a long time, and what I have found out is there is a difference between purpose-driven and presence-driven. Because I have found a lot of people driven by their bondages to find purpose. And they'll, they'll want to do things in church, and the next thing you know, their, their bondages will purpose them to take over the church, and just all kinds of things, which has really been a quandary for a lot of pastors. Because bondages and, and generational curses and all these things can drive you to find purpose. And many times, though, this run from church to church to church to church. And, and many times, they're, they're an A-type personality. They're, they're very go I mean, they can get stuff done. You want to you know, you, you, you have a, a, a yard sale to raise funds for the church. Next thing you know, they've taken over the entire Walmart parking lot, and you have five acres of, of stuff to sell for the church. You know? And so, so, the, so they, they, they create this huge thing, and then when they leave, they create a big hole when they leave out for the next purpose because it's like, okay, this wasn't enough, this wasn't enough, this wasn't enough. And what I have found out is, is that bondages usually drive you to find purpose, being purpose-driven can cause you to be so busy with purpose that you miss the point. Religion is filled with purpose and activity. And so you can find purpose and completely miss God. Because the devil will give you a purpose on purpose to keep you away from the presence of God. The presence of God, uh, if your presence of God driven, it will cause you to remove anything in your life that would diminish or hinder God's manifested presence. And that's the key. Because you start getting rid of all the junk that would offend God. And this is not only in our church services, and, and if you've been around biblical life long enough, I mean, we show up and we actually have our first praise and worship service before we have our regular praise and worship service because we're, try, we're, we're praying, we're doing spiritual warfare in the area, and we're trying to find the groove that God's moving in uh, that morning because everything is about his presence. And uh, Mary and I determined a long time ago, we don't care how many people show up just as long as God shows up. Because there, there are a lot of places right now that there are tens of thousands of people meeting, but God doesn't show up. I would rather have, if I would rather have Jesus than silver or gold, I would rather have him than multitudes untold, okay? I want him. I've got to have him, but you see, we, we come to church and we experience this to set the mark, to, to set the bench, that this is what I want the rest of the week in my life and in my prayer life, and if I begin to find anything that begins to take away from his manifested presence, I go, oh, wait a minute now. I, I've got to step back from this. If God isn't going to be a part of it, I'm not going to be a part of it. Right. Yep. And to answer the purpose-driven life, we can go to Psalms 46 this morning, and I want you to, sh I want to, I want you to see something, and it, it's, it's very important. Purpose-driven, they're always looking for something to do. But see, if you're in Messiah, if you're in Christ, you can do nothing and be at peace. God tells us in Psalms 46, 10 and 11, be still and know that I am God. A lot of purpose-driven believers stumble over, but, 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 but be still? How can I be still? I got too much purpose to do. But yet, you see, when you really have the Prince of Peace living on the inside of you, you can do nothing and just have him and be at peace. That's when you know you're free. Now, I'm not preaching a doctrine of do nothing, okay? I'm preaching a doctrine of you know you're really free when you can do nothing and just be with him. Look what he says. I, I, I kind of like how this is together. He said, if we can learn to be still and know that he is God, he will be exalted among the heathen. You see that there? 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And see, there's a connection we're going to see this morning with his presence, with having refuge. The refuge doesn't come in purpose. The refuge comes in presence. I want you to think about that just for a minute. We get so busy being busy that we forget about just simply practicing the presence of God in our day in and day out lives. And that's going to be critical. Now, I want us to, I'm going to kind of walk you around the Bible this morning. Let's go to Amos chapter 5 and verse 4. How many know Amos is a judgment book? Amos is, is talking about how God is going to judge his people. And that we've got to learn in the midst of judgment that if we follow God's instructions, you can make it through. I saw a real interesting article this week uh, uh, from a Christian news network that was talking about you know, how many know there's a lot of persecution right now in Muslim nations that are, that are being taken over by radical Islam against Christianity. Do you know what they found that their, their key strategic uh, thing that the, the Christians need to do to survive? Now hold on to this. They pray. If they pray... The enemy gets confused and can't find them. If they pray, if they start seeking the face of God, if they start seeking God, all of a sudden the, the, uh, the almost unstoppable force that is determined and in, in investing everything they can to hunt Christians down, so all of a sudden they can't find any Christians. If they pray. How I many know if you don't do that, you can have 15 years of food and hand it over to the Antichrist if you're not careful because if you're not praying, they'll find you. Then they'll, they will, they will re-disseminate and spread the wealth. That's right. Well, they wouldn't do that in America. There's already laws in the books. Did you know that? There are already laws today that if they implemented them, they could take every bit of food out of your house and everything out of your house and, 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 and because they're saying, well, you're hoarding. Uh, we, we, now, you know, it used to be, you know, if you had more than a month's worth of food, then that was hoarding. They could say if you have more than three days' worth of food, that's hoarding. They, they can define it however they want to define it. And so it's just not having the food. It's just not being prepared for disaster. It's starting to be disaster-proof. Now, look what Amos tells us in verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall what? Live. In the midst of disaster, in the midst of God's judging things, God tells his people that if you will seek me, you will live. He didn't say if you will seek me and have four years worth of, of freeze-dried food. He said if you will seek me, you'll live. Now, part of that seeking, God may, may put it on your heart to have six months' worth of, of food in, in your house, six weeks of food, whatever, and, and that de depends on family to family. You, you follow what God tells you to do. But in the midst of all you're getting, you better learn to get the presence of God because he is the only one. It is his presence that protects. David gets with this same theme. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 16. And this is a psalm he wrote after a great battle or a great victory that he had gotten. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail this morning because I'm just, kind of, I'm just kind of preparing the way for the series I'm getting ready to teach because we got, we got a lot of place, we got a lot of things to put into place. But let's look here at verse 8. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing uh, psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that what? Seek him. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face once a week. When the preacher tells you to. If the service goes that way. Continually. There's something about seeking the face of God. I love what he connects here. 
When you seek the Lord, you seek his strength. If you seek his strength without seeking his face, you never get there. So many people seek the miracles of God, but they don't seek God. And what happens is you open yourself up to false signs and wonders. You think you can get them without lining yourself up with God. When you seek God, you would begin removing everything that would offend him in your seeking. So if I'm seeking him continually... I'm getting rid of all the junk that might offend him. I'm getting rid of all the things that, that aren't necessarily uh, a part of really seeking the face of God. Now, th this, this is hard to take because if we, if we do this, we, we eliminate about 90% of the junk that goes on in churches today. You see, we're worried about being seeker sensitive. We need to be sensitive about the one whom we are seeking. Last week when, when I read a quote from Dake with some of the, the verses we were dealing with, he said that we need to realize that we need to deal with God is going to require us to deal with him on his terms. You see, if we're really serving God, if we're really seeking God, he is perfect. He is unchangeable. So if he's unchangeable and we start seeking him, who got to change? We've got to change. And yet what we do is we, we construct all these different methods and all these different programs and all these different church things about it's like God has got to take us because of the cross. He now has to take us on our terms. And we can modify those terms to whatever brings in the people. In other words, church becomes about self and not about the Savior. That's an antichrist system. Because self is the very epitome of the Antichrist. When Lucifer fell, he quit talking about who God was, and he said, I will, I will, I will, I will, and I will. That, that, is, that is the very core of Luciferianism is, I will become like a God. I will do this. I will do that. That's why in the occult, the highest day of the year, we think, well, what is the highest day of the year in the occult? You know, is, 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 it, is it Beltane? Is it Samhain? What is it? It's your birthday. For you, that's your highest day because that is the ultimate day of self. If it's, if it's all about self and not about him, it's becoming a part of another system. Everything that we read from Genesis to Revelation, it was man that messed up. God stepped in, but then God, God is an unmovable object as far as him compromising. The ultimate no compromising individual in the universe is Almighty God. The cross did not require God to compromise. If he could compromise, he wouldn't have had to have done the cross. Wouldn't that Jesus' prayer, if there's plan B, if there's another way? Now, for me, that answers a lot of questions. Number one, God, God, when it comes to his justice, he is uncompromising. When it comes to defining sin, he is uncompromising. Yes. And this whole thing of, well, there are many ways to heaven. No, there's not. There's one because Jesus already asked if there was another way, let's get it done. And his answer was no. Let me tell you something. If Jesus got a no, you're going to get a no. Right. We're still talking about seeking him. So I think sometimes we get so much into God seeking us that we forget about seeking him. Somehow we switch this. It's not on our terms. It's on his terms. His terms was the cross. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Because I'm, I'm trying to get us somewhere in your thinking. Because what you need to make it through, you can't buy on the Home Shopping Network. As much as I love Brother Baker, you can't even buy it on the Jim Baker show. And I mean, he's trying to get people ready. He's actually trying to get people to even seek God. That's right. He's trying hard. Yes, he is. And he said, while you're seeking him, maybe it might be good that you can eat too, so I want to make sure you have that. Tell me. You, you, can, you can hear the love and the care in the brother's heart and the alarm in his voice is saying, wake up, come on now. Yeah. Stick your head up out of the hole and see what time it is. 
But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that at least once a week seek him. Maybe if the feeling gets right, seek him. Diligently. That means to do your utmost, that we have got to seek God. Well, didn't Jesus seek me? We have forgotten that, yes, God seeks you and hunts you down by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring you to the cross. And once you get saved, then it's your job to begin seeking God. It's like he said, tag, you're it. And we as believers have forgotten that. We think, well, I'm completely accepted in the cross. I don't have to do anything. How many know know salvation is a done deal? It's done deal. You can't do anything to earn your salvation, but if you don't seek God, you're never going to grow in the kingdom. You're never going to be prepared. You're never going to be ready. Because in seeking God, things happen. You begin to, first of all, you've got to define who you're seeking. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to know when you find him. And there are a lot of Jesuses out there that everybody's trying to proclaim. Go back to the Bible. God is very strict about who he'll, who he'll walk with. He's very strict about it. And he said, with Abraham, he said, if you're going to walk with me, you be upright. You've you got to walk the way I tell you to walk. Otherwise, I can't walk with you. And the body of Christ thinks that, that because of the cross, that God's got to walk with us any way that we are. Guys, even all of us, we have, we have people, we could even have family members that we love. We just don't want to be around them. They're rude, crude, and obnoxious. And everything out of their mouth what makes you either want to run or turn red, you know, an embarrassment. Sometimes turn white. You, you, you just don't know. You love them. If they needed something, I mean, you'd go sell whatever you had to get them. You, you care for them. You just can't be around them. I think God has instilled that in us because most of the time that's the way he feels about us. He loved us so much he gave his only son on the cross, but now that we've got saved, he still can't be around us. What a tragic thing. But I want to give you a secret. Can I give you a secret this morning? Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let me, let me tell you about the story about this. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken captive under King Saul. And now that David is king, they recapture the Ark. Which Now the Ark of the Covenant represents the throne of God upon the earth. It's his rulership. It's the very symbol of not only his mercy, but his rulership. And David is a man that's almost, he, he, he's kind of cross-dispensational, or a man who dwelt outside of his, his own dispensation. How many know that it required the Levitical priesthood and the Kohen doing their whole thing and the, and, and the tabernacle and everything? Yet we see David actually puts the Ark of the Covenant in his backyard, goes out there and lays before the Ark of the Covenant. It, it, it's, he, he's kind of like a New Testament believer in Old Testament times. But yet we see him do the exact same thing of cross-dispensationalism when he finds the ark because he doesn't go back to the Torah to find out how to handle the ark. And so they, now, I mean, he, I mean, he tries to do nice. He, he goes and gets a donkey cart that has never been used before. I mean, it is prim and it, it is brand new. It might have had a Cadillac logo on the back of it. We don't know. But I mean, he, 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 he made sure that it was very nice and that it had never been used for anything else. And looked very nice, and it looked really great. And they begin bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem in an unworthy manner, not according to his standards, but according to God's. And a man reaches out to try to study the Ark, and it kills him because he did that. And see, the first sin was not him trying to reach out to study the Ark. That would have never have happened if David would have went to God's instructions on how to handle the Ark to begin with. Because God will not walk on us based upon our own terms. He will only walk with us based upon his terms. That's why I've got to seek him. I've got to find out what I need to get out of the way, what I need to do so that he can walk with me. That's part of the seeking. And so, you know, the guy drops dead, and David kind of goes, whoa, I don't know if I want to bring that in Jerusalem or not. (laughs) You know, I, I, I didn't realize it had such power to it. And obviously I did something wrong. 
And so we pick up here in 10, in verse 10 of 2 Samuel chapter 6. So David would not remove the Ark of the Covenant unto him into the city of David. But David carried it outside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the Ark of the Covenant continued in the house of Obed-Edom. That is a type in the shadow of the New Testament believer, if you know what you're doing. The ark, the throne of God, the rule of God, was established in the house of Obed-Edom. And how many know that he didn't try to use it as an antenna for his TV or anything else? You know, one guy touched it and died. Obed-Edom treated God with the respect that he deserved. And God's throne was established in his house. The pres See, that throne represents the presence of God. Did you know that the temple that Jesus walked into in Jerusalem, that the presence of, the manifested presence of God had never been in that particular temple until he walked into it. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. The Ark of the Covenant was lost when Nebuchadnezzar came in and tore it down and he didn't get the Ark. We're still speculating what happened to it. Some say that Solomon had some kind of lever mechanism and, 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 and hid it away underneath uh, somewhere in Israel or in Jerusalem. Uh, others simply say that God took it. We do know, and, and, uh, when I was talking with Dr. Looper about this, he pointed me to a verse in Zechariah, I believe it was, that said the ark would never be found again. So, you don't know. Jesus may end up having it on the back of his horse when he comes back for all I know. You don't know. But so when they, they, when, when they did the, the temple of Herod, never had the manifested presence of God in that temple until there was a 13-year-old boy or 12-year-old boy come walking in there and begin to debate with the doctors of the law. Later on, he came back into that same temple and the presence of God cleared the money changers out of the temple. You see, the presence of God requires things to be cleared out to be able to be there. I like this. It was in his house for three months. Anytime you see three, I always think of Jesus was in the grave for three days. Every time I see that. But look what it says. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. The manifested presence of God brings blessing. You can seek blessing without seeking God, and you're not going to get it. Yeah. It seems like anymore in the charismatic movement, everybody's running after signs and wonders. Everybody's running after blessing. Everybody's just running, 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 running. I'm an old charismatic, and I do know what to do. <laughs> because one of the things I remember in the charismatic movement, we knew that signs and wonders, miracles, and blessing were a byproduct. Were a byproduct of what? The presence of God. That we were never satisfied with anything until we got the presence of God there. That's what brought the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is people weren't even really even trying to seek after tongues or seek after some kind of manifestation. They were seeking God. They knew that they were not, they did not have the manifested presence of God as we see in the word of God that they had. And they said, I want that level of presence. And they sought him with prayer and fasting. And they repented and they began to do all these things that they needed to do simply to seek the face of God. And once his presence came and was established, everything else fell into place. And yet now we're, 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 so, we're so caught up in the goodies that we won't take the time that we need to simply seek his face. We want God to come just as I am and on my terms. I mean, no, the only, you can come to God just as you are to get saved. But once you get saved, you're not supposed to be as you are anymore. Right. You're supposed to be as he is. We're still stuck just as I am, just as I am, just as my old honorary self. Now, now because of the cross, he's got to walk with me. Well, he ain't, he's not going to be walking with you. 
There may be a couple of times he, 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 he does you like Peter that he jerks you up when you're trying to walk on the water and before you drown, he may, you may end up having your hair. Have you ever done that in your, in your Christian walk? You wake up one morning and you realize you have spiritually sore hair because Jesus had to yank you up before you killed yourself, where if you really would have been walking with him, you wouldn't have done it in the first place. Guys, when we look at this, no wonder we say, no wonder we see the why God said, "Name us if you seek me, you'll live." Seek me and live. We've got to come to God on His terms. We've got to walk with God according to His terms. That's why the commandments of God are so important. Here's a hint: His commandments are His terms. They are His terms. They're what He taught to Abraham, so Abraham can walk with Him. There was a guy named Enoch that so walked in them so powerfully the earth couldn't hold them anymore. And God says, you know what? I'm going to pull you up here so I can put you back down here later. Because, I mean, you got this thing down so much, you're going to give hell to the Antichrist. And so I'm just going to go ahead and, and do that. And there was another guy named Elijah that did the same thing. He's going to come down. And, he's, and I always wonder why Elijah never got, gained victory over Jezebel. Because Jezebel is going to be in its zenith during the reign of the Antichrist. How much so? I kind of believe, and there, there's a lot of evidence pointing that the Antichrist will probably be the, uh, uh, the Mahdi. Uh, within Islam, they're looking for their coming Messiah. And he wears the symbol, the crescent moon. Now this, this is something that has really even quandered Islamic people. Because historically, long before Islam, the crescent moon was the sign of a female. Samarimus. It was the star that was the sign of Nimrod. And yet, they use the crescent moon, which means the Antichrist will be coming in the power of Jezebel. And so God says, you know what, I'm going I'm I'm to let you have the final showdown. I'm going to bring you a Nini and say, this make the life of this thing a living hell because Enoch and Elijah will be able to call at will all the plagues that came on Egypt. Can you imagine people say, we're going to get you now. And they go say, oh yeah, fire and brimstone. <laughs> you like lies? <laughs> I mean, they're going to have, they're going to have a rough road to hoe. Because God said, these boys got it down so much. I, they, they, they know how to walk with me. They know, how, they know how to call down judgment and don't flinch when they do it. Let me say something to Elijah. God, I love Elijah. <laughs> Cry a little louder. You know, they're trying to call down fire. Maybe he's asleep. I mean, they're cutting themselves with knives. Maybe he's deaf today. Can you, can you see him calling down a plague of frogs and go, knee deep, knee deep. That, that's within the character of Elijah. It really is. You want some boils with that? He wouldn't have a problem. Because he already knew they had already set their face on who they sought and who they walked with. And see, when it comes down to the end times, it comes down to between who you have been seeking and who you have established your walk with. Depends upon what side of the line you're on. Now let's go to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is the fasting chapter. I love to teach on it in fasting, but I actually want to pull up verse 12 and talk about that. Because fasting, how many know fasting has a whole lot more to do than without going without food? But those that fast with God correctly and try to walk with him correctly, this is what God says about them that they shall be of thee, uh, and they that, then they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and they shall be called the repair of the breach. What's the repair of the breach? How many know walking with God, you're supposed to have a hedge of protection? When you sin, it tears down that hedge. When, when I do righteousness because I love God, when I do what God's word says, it empowers God to move in my life. Have you, have you recognized that yet? 
that when you, it's like when you work the word, the word will work. When you do what God says because you love him, not because you're trying to, to bend his hand and make him give you something you don't need, but you simply do it because you love him. It be, that obedience, that's why the Torah is, is a hedge around you. The commandments of God are a hedge around you as you're doing it because you love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your heart, and all your soul. It builds that hedge around you, and it empowers the kingdom of God around you. When you sin and don't repent, it empowers the kingdom of darkness. This is one of the things that we have learned in spiritual warfare, that the devil to take over an area has got to get sins repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's off of that platform of repeated sin that he begins to build spiritual power. And, I mean, you can try to pray over it and all these other kinds of things, but until you ask for God to give the, for, forgive the sins of the land, to forgive the sins that were done in that area, the moment you did that, you pull out the plug of his power. And so sin in a believer's life, violation of God's commandments or Torah in a believer's life, begins to make hedge, holes in your hedge of protection. That's why the, God said, I could find nobody to stand in the gap. And we never really thought what the gap was. The gap was the prophet comes and sees their violation of God's ways, and so he stands in that hole, and he begins to, God, please give them time. And then he turns to him and says, would you look at the hole that you've made? Repent and return to God. Start seeking his face so that you fill in your hole. And, and he's doing this dual thing going on, and we think, well, that's just sweet. That somebody, God needed somebody to intercede. It isn't just intercession. It's intercession and rebuking. Right. See, everybody wants somebody to pray for them, but nobody wants somebody to correct them. Right. Yep. And a prophet always has the tendency to find the hole. A real prophet will find that hole of violation of God's ways and say, you know what? You're, you're trying to find where the little fox can get in, and Satan is actually bringing in three trucks, semis, side by side, and he, he brings them in together, and you're looking to plug up a hole. How about go ahead and fill in this five-lane highway that you got coming into your life called all the sin that you thought the cross gave you permission to do? New Testament, let him who sinned sin no more. And see that, so when we read, when you read the whole context of Isaiah 58, you had a people just like today. They're close with God. Oh, I want to learn the word. I want to learn the word. Micah, how many times? I want to learn the word. And they start talking the word, and they don't want to hear it. Well, it wasn't that word I was after. <laughs> I want a pleasant word. It is pleasant. We've all ran across that. Christians say, boy, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll live the word. Do you do this? No. Will you do this? No. Do you do this? No. Will you do this? No. What do you do? I go to church. <laughs> you go to church to find out what to do. <laughs> That's right. It calls you to repentance and it begins teaching you to walk in the ways of God if it's a true church. Yeah. Yeah. And so in, in the beginning of Isaiah 58, he says, they, they, they act like a nation who wants to learn my ways and do all this. And then they, they say they're close to me, but they never do any of it. And they've replaced it with other purposes. All their own stuff they do. They don't even do my Sabbath right. There, there's a whole rhythm of the Sabbath, which we, we may get into because it's kind of in this, because that's one of the bricks that need to be restored to your path. But see, if you don't learn to shut down, you know, why, why did God, well, I'm going to say this, why did God meet with Adam and the cool of the evening every day? so that he could give him the insights and the power to do what he needed to do the next day. So there's a rhythm to everything of walking. And then it was so vital that one day of the week, and it had to be the seventh day before you start everything else over again, that you need to meet with God to get instruction, to get wisdom, insights, and the power to do what you do the next week. And so the, the whole thing of Isaiah is, this is the fast to break the bonds of wickedness, to start getting the wickedness out, to start getting this stuff out. This is the fast that I want you to do. It's not just going out with food. And when you do fast, according to Isaiah 58, you take the money in which you'd have bought you, like if you're going to fast for three days, take the food money that you're going to buy and give it to somebody in need. Notice I didn't say it to the offering plate. It's to somebody in need. Give it to the poor. Give it to somebody that may not be, they're fasting not because they're seeking God, they're fasting because they ain't got nothing to eat. 
And so you, you go and you try to, to, to ease their distress. And so all these that are really seeking God, trying to come back to God on his terms, and are really seeking him, not with lip service, but with heart reverence toward God. God says of these people, they're going to rebuild the old waste places. What are the old waste places? The places that have run down because religion took us away from what God said really needed to be done. They were old waste places, but they were the original places of God. And that they are the repairs of the breach. They begin to put everything back in to build the hedge of protection. Let me tell you something. In the days to come, you better have your hedge of protection in place. That's right. And the restore of paths to dwell in. How you walk reflects how you dwell. How you walk. You see, biblically and Hebraically, God came down in the cool evening and he walked with Adam and Eve. God came down and all we know about Enoch is he walked with God. That's all we know. And he did it so well, God says, I've got to pull you up for another time. And so he understood the ways of God and he walked them so perfectly that God says, my presence and therefore my power can flow through you in an unprecedented way. What was the call of Abraham? Come walk with me. God had to walk him out of Babylon, then walk him into being a mature believer in him. Had to walk him out of paganism into walking with a God that became of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Over and over again, walk with... What was, the, what was the call of Jesus after he said, repent, but there were 12, he said, come follow me. Come walk with me. Come on, walk with me. The paths to dwell in. You see, saints of old used to know this. There was a, a, a Christian classic called the Pilgrim's Progress. Have you ever read it? If not, you need to. As Christian was walking out of the city of destruction and walking toward the city of God, there was a path that he had to find and walk. And there were those that tried to find other paths that looked easier, that always led to destruction. Because saints used to know that there was a path, there was a place that you had to walk with God. And God will only be on that path if you try to find an easier path, if you try to find uh, even a more popular path. It may be more popular because what we have done is we have all walked together to find a purpose instead of walking with God to find his presence. Sometimes you don't always go with the crowd. That's right. It's time for us, if we're going to be prepared for the days ahead, I have got to learn because look at the way we do it, in, 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 in especially in, in a lot of churches. You've got to have mood lighting you got to have a little, a little stream run, you know, and all these different things. It's almost like you're trying to get everything right on the first date or something. And, and it, just maybe if you get everything right, you can kind of feel just a little goosebump of the presence of God. How about when bombs are flying? And soldiers are marching. You haven't eaten in two days, not because you're fasting, but because you're, you're not eating so that you can give the little bit of food that you have to the kids because they, can go, they can't go as long as you can without food. And you don't know what's going to happen in the next hour. Let me tell you something. There is where you better learn to be able to bring in the presence of God. Because there, the presence of God is going to help you live. I believe we're going to enter into a time. Some of the miracles that we see in Jesus' life where he took the loaves of fish and bread is not, is not just you know, an interesting gospel story. It may be provision in the future. That you just have a little, and God makes it a lot to feed those in need. We need to be able to have, to be able to bring in the presence of God and have him there when the kids are crying, the kids are running and screaming through the house, the dishwasher's broken, their pipe's leaking, 
The phone's ringing with telemarketers, one after another after another. Let me tell you something. If you can't bring in the presence of God during that, you're really going to have a hard time during the tribulation period. Because, believe it or not, telemarketers are not part of the tribulation period, even though many of us thought they were. Robocalls. I want to end this this morning with Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. This is probably one of the most misquoted scriptures in the entire Old Testament. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And I learned this as a young Baptist minister. And so we have our creed on the wall and said, now you've got to, now we've all got to agree to agree on this. And if we all agree on this, then you can walk with me and I can walk with you. And we forget the context. Amos is they left God and God is now judging them because they were supposed to be walking with them. They made covenant to walk with them and they're not walking with them. So sandwiched in to I'm going to judge you in verse 1 and 2 and I'm going to judge you 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and on and on and on. God throws right in the middle of this can two walk together except they be agreed. And we don't have the context to even put this together. Do you know that three times a year, everybody walked to Jerusalem? And so you have hundreds upon hundreds of people walking the road. You know, now Chuck can be driving down the highway and I'm driving down the highway just because we're on the same highway. We're not driving together. You see, there was a concept that as you all were walking toward Jerusalem, a couple of families would get together and they would agree to walk together together. That's what this is talking about. That we can't walk together unless we agree to walk together. And God won't walk with you unless you agree to his terms. And what? And this is an indictment against those that Amos was speaking to said, you said you were walking with God, but you begin to demand that God walk with you based upon your terms, and God won't do it. And the only place of safety is to walk with God, but you've got to agree to walk with him, and he's got to agree to walk with you. There are a lot of people right now in the body of Messiah that God dearly loves, God just can't walk with. And it goes well beyond the ham sandwich you got in your pocket at the moment. Okay? How I many you know that's, you, you, don't, you don't walk with God with barbecue pork chop breath. But how I many know there's a whole lot more than just them? People have problems with that. You know, if you have problems with that, you're going to have problems with a lot of stuff in this book. You can't walk with God and be in adultery. You can't walk with God and be in fornication. You can't walk with God and be a liar. You can't walk with God and be a thief. He can't walk with you. And God is saying, I've given you my standard right here. The cross brings you back into place where you can live the standard because now Jesus is living on the inside of you. But I've still got to agree to walk with him on his terms. The call is still, come walk before me and be thou upright and perfect. Therefore, there is a path that if I'm really seeking God, guys, if we're really seeking God, really seeking him on his terms, we're going to be the ones that help restore the path that when people say, how come bombs drop on my house and don't drop on yours? How come, how come, how come, the, how come the, the, the forces of the Antichrist find me but can't find you? You see, if I'm hidden in God. That's part of what, the, what David was talking about when he said, he that dwelleth in the shadow of the Most High God. How many know you've got to be walking with somebody to fall within their shadow? I don't want God way off over there when the devil's right here. I want him right here. And not just right here as, as far as theologically. I want him right here in reality. Not just doctrinally. 
I, I, don't want the, I don't want the Lord to doctrinally beat up the devil when the devil comes after Mike Lake. I want him to physically grab him and thrash him and throw him to the ground and say, leave my kid alone. He only does that when you're under the shadow. This is my kid. Now, he's changed everything in his life to try to walk with me, and he's come to me based upon my terms, not his. You know what? I got his back. Oh, Mike, show me that. Go back to Isaiah 58. He says, if you fast and seek me doing my way, I'll be your rear guard. Rear reward. That, that's old King James. Rear guard. All the armor that we read in Ephesians was all for a frontal attack, but the back is open. Because Roman soldiers were in position to go forward. God says, I got your back. You walk with me, I got your back. I got place, I'll have covered what you can't see if you'll take care of what you can see. Right. Guys, if I'm presence driven. One of the things, and there, there, there are guys in ministry that I, I really have high esteem for, and it's not necessarily for their preaching style, but some of the things that they've said almost in passing that really kind of said, okay, you just went up another notch because I've got a lot of guys that, have, that I know that have really good preaching style, but I, they're, they're kind of down here as far as I'm concerned because they've used that preaching style to preach whatever the people wanted to hear. But I hear guys saying, you know, I started to walk into this situation and the peace of God left me and I backed up and said, oh, no, I ain't doing anything, Father, until I get your presence back. Where, what, what did, where, where did I mess up? What, what, uh, I mean, they, they almost get rattled. When the presence of God, when that peace leaves them, it rattles them because they're so used. Where, 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 what, what, what turn did I make? Where, where did I go, Father, that I, that, I, that I missed you? And they'll stop and they'll not do another thing until they find out what they did wrong and they, and they get his presence back. Then they know they can go on. Now, they may not be able to preach themselves out of a wet, a wet paper sack, but they got my respect. Because they have learned, they have mastered being presence driven. How many times? Now I've heard, I've heard faith ministers talk about this. They go, I'm a man of my word and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And so they, they did it and they miss God, but they were keeping their word. But his presence pulled back as a sign of saying, whoa, Nellie, <laughs> you know, why don't, why don't you just, you know, you can, you can still call somebody and say, I don't have the peace of God to do this right now. I am going to keep my promise to you, but there's something going on. And how many men of God just went on ahead and, and left that presence and drove themselves right into a car accident? Many of them have. Where maybe God would have said, why don't you wait five minutes? Why don't, you, why don't you call them and do it tomorrow because the devil has been really working hard about getting set up and I'm trying to pull back my presence to pull you back. That's right. And because we've been so purpose-driven and not presence-driven, we have purposed ourselves right into some bad situations. It's all going to come down to learning how to walk with God, having those paths to walk in with Him. And be, I want to be so sensitive... That if, well, how many of us have kids in the, had, had, uh, ever, ever taken kids in the store and they're supposed to be walking with you? Yeah. And they're still walking with you four aisles over? Yeah. How many know that isn't walking with you? Sure that. And uh, that's the way a lot of times we walk with God. I want to be so sensitive to him that if I get more than three foot away, I start sensing something's wrong. He's starting to pull this way, and I'm starting to pull this way. Right. And wh why do the kids end up four aisles over? Because a sparkly yeah. got their attention. It's like mom and dad just disappeared. It's <laughs> toys or something, candy or something. Something that the, something, the eyes of the flesh, lust of the flesh, lust, you know, pride of life, love of the world, pull you away from God. Part of our training on what God's trying to do to prepare us for the days ahead is we get so sensitive to his presence that when I start going, uh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> it may have caught my attention, but just for a second, I'm, I'm looking for him twice as hard as I was trying to find that sparkly. 
Because I tell you what, Satan's got sparklies with your name on it. He knows exactly what would appeal to you. Just exactly what to give you purpose <laughs> for a time before it kills you. But it's all got to be about presence. The presence of God. You see, as long as there was this huge manifested presence of God coming out of the top of the tabernacle, the Bible says all the nations round about Israel feared them. No presence, there's no need to fear. Why does the world no longer fear the church? No presence. We're like Samson. We're trying to shake ourselves and trying to figure out why the Philistines are getting us and no strength comes because we have left the presence somewhere along the line. And it's time for us to be repairs of the breach, to be restorers of paths to dwell in and to walk in because we become presence sensitive to walk with him. Father, I just ask that you would just loose a grace on the inside of our hearts. Father, every place that the enemy has tried to make us callous to your presence, that he has put so many things in between us being sensitive to the moving of your spirit. Father, whether it's sin in our life, Father, whether it's wounds in our life, whatever the case may be, or maybe we've never been really told that we need to develop this. Father, I just loose the anointing of the Holy Spirit into those areas. Father, remove the callous, remove the wounds. Father, begin this morning that we could just be so sensitive to your voice and so sensitive to your presence that we will seek with all of our hearts to stay close to you. Father, there are so many things that the enemy can put between us that I could go on for days and still not cover every situation. But what I can cover is the antidote, the blood of Jesus and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, pour in the blood, the wine, and the oil. Father, let the wine and the oil begin to heal us and restore us so that we can walk with you. Father, in the weeks to come, we're going to find things to repent of, we're going to find things to establish so that we could walk with you in greater ways. And Father, I ask that you would begin all of us on this journey this morning, on this Sabbath, a journey into wholeness, a journey into maturity, a journey into walking in righteousness so that we could walk with you. Father, along this journey, put whatever we need to do in our hearts that we can deal with. Father, whether it's at home or whether it's from the pulpit, Father, we all open ourselves up to the leading of your spirit so that issues will be dealt with and that the kingdom will be dealt with properly and in balance so that we can establish our walk, that we can walk in your power. Father, because when we walk with you, the fowler is tripped up in his own snare. The devil digs a pit for him to fall in it while we're safe because we're walking with you and that you establish that place of safety because of your presence in our lives. Father, we thank you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.